message of God this morning, the church at war, war with deception. Let me now present to you the messenger of the Lord, Pastor Noel Spinoza. Obviously, I was not there when the queen died, but I am quite sure as to what happened because the tradition goes back many generations, in fact, hundreds of years. Someone would announce the queen is dead, and that would be immediately followed by the announcement, long live the king. And in this case, that would be King Charles III. The idea of that ritual is to make the point that the sovereign authority of monarchy is without any gap transferred to the heir, which of course is oftentimes by promigeniture the firstborn child of the male, but now it is also allowed to have the female. With kingship, Charles III assumes many titles. One of those titles is defender of the faith because the monarch of England is considered a titular head of the Church of England. So that raises a question about the personal faith of King Charles III. I have no doubt about the personal faith of Queen Elizabeth II. She has spoken so much about it during Christmas messages. She really believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not know about Charles III that remains to be said. But for the church, the idea of being defender of the faith is more than just a ceremonial title. It is a mandate that engages us in real warfare. Now, I told you that the beginning of that war goes back to Eden when God himself made the declaration as a curse upon the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And from that time on, there has been warfare between God and his forces, his people, and Satan and his cohorts. In the Old Testament, God's people was Israel, and Israel was mandated to fight the battles of Yahweh. And that fight often is in real military warfare. But behind the warfare is the strength of the Lord. When Israel became unfaithful, it also manifested in their defeats during battles. Now, when we turn to the New Testament, the warfare perpetuates, but it is no longer the nation of Israel, and it is no longer by military warfare and political conflicts, but rather in terms of spiritual warfare. And I made the emphasis last week as we began this series that the first enemy that we should identify is not any of the people we think are opposing the cause of God. They may be instruments, but the real enemy is Satan and the spirits. People laugh at the very thought of the fact that we still believe in a spiritual realm. But we do, and that is in fact a better explanation for the inexplicable evil that we find in this world. And yet the warfare is real, and that warfare is something that we must the wage in faithfulness to our God. And we are doing this series in preparation for our anniversary month. I am aware that there are other figures in the New Testament to speak of the church's mandate. Most of them are more pleasant to think about, figures like harvest. But I'm using the figure of warfare precisely because it is unpopular and probably the mandate that is most unacceptable in this very tolerant age. But we need to understand that the battle ultimately first is against the realm of the spirits. We saw that in our message last week. The church is at war against powerful evil spirits, but already defeated in Christ. Now I invite you to turn to another passage that reveals to us where we find the warfare of the church is waged against. Turn to the letter of Jude. That's the letter just before the last book of Revelation. Jude, and we will read verses 1 to 4. The letter of Jude, verses 1 to 4. 
Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. One commentator said that the short letter of Jude is one of the fireworks books of the Bible. His language is very piercing, and you can sense that his spirit is very intense as he writes this letter. Ironically, it was not his intention. His intention was to write a pastoral instruction to his addresses and tell them about this pleasant subject of our common salvation. But then he heard the news just before he actually began writing. He heard a very concerning news that certain people have crept in who managed to get into churches who were circulating false teachings. So instead of the letter he intended to write, Jude rushed a letter. In fact, in his rush, he only copied a bulk of his letter from another letter, and that is the second letter of Peter. And you will find a lot of duplication by Jude of the second letter of Peter because he was rushing. He copied what Peter already wrote about. So instead of a quiet, pleasant pastoral instruction about salvation, the main appeal that Jude gives to his readers is a call to continue for the faith. Oh, that is no less than a declaration of war. War against whom? Well, let me give you this message. The church is at war against deceitful errors in safeguarding the Christian faith. Ang iglesia ay nasa pakikidigma laban sa mga mapanlinlang na kamalian sa ating pagbabantay sa pananampaniniwalang kristyano. The church is at war against deceitful errors in safeguarding the Christian faith. Now, let me explain that when Jude mentions content for the faith, by the faith, as in the rest of the New Testament letters, this is not the faith of believing. This is not the act of faith. Rather, this is the faith that is believed. The cluster of truths that becomes the object of faith when we become Christians. The danger that Jude sees is the free course given to errors in the teaching ministry of churches he is writing. And the problem with the time of Jude, that of giving free course to errors without challenging them, I can tell you that it has multiplied many times over in our time. Errors are just perpetrated and they are either just tolerated or even celebrated. And what is worst is that this is happening in many who still bear the label church. Now, errors have changed in shapes and colors, and they number in the thousands. But what is constant, and which is still in the singular, is the faith. And the mandate of the church is to contend for the faith, the cluster of truth that makes us what we are as a Christian church. You give up the faith, whether you remain, retain the label church, and you are no longer a church of Jesus Christ. So if we are to be a faithful church, we need to be accepting this mandate to contend for the faith. There are two things that we need to attach to this mandate of contending against deceitful errors. The first is that deception is most dangerous when it resembles truth. Ang panlilinlang ay pinakamapanganib kapag may anyo ng katotohanan. 
Deception is most dangerous when it resembles truth. And the second is faithfulness calls for contention for the unchanging truth. Ang katapatan ay tumatawag ng pakikipaglaban para sa hindi nagbabagong katotohanan. Faithfulness calls for contention for the unchanging truth. The first thing that we need to know is that deception is most dangerous when it resembles truth. Jude reveals that the reason this deception gained entry into churches, he used the expression, they crept in unnoticed. In the older translation, like the King James Version, the words are, they crept in unawares. The literal translation is, they wormed their way in. The word used is closely related to the word in Greek for smuggling. Now, when you smuggle goods, you may have someone <clears throat> who is your co-perpetrator, who is an insider in customs, and you're able to get through the goods illegally. Now, the idea is that these people were able to smuggle their teachings with the knowledge of some that they are doing so, and they are not challenging those false teachings. And for that, for what reason, the word Jude chooses is unaware. And that tells us about ignorance. Ignorance of the Christian doctrine is the ally of deception in the church. Ang kamangmangan sa doktrina ng Kristiyano ay ka kakampi ng pandilin lang sa iglesia. Ignorance of the Christian doctrine, the Christian teaching, is the ally of deception in the church. Now, it is something of a given that deception surrounds us in the world. Wherever you turn to, there is deception. You turn on the TV, there is deception. I'm not against TV watching. You use the social media, it is full of deception. You can find deception everywhere in the world, but the church can only remain what it is supposed to be by not allowing deception to be taught officially in the church. The people that Jude is writing to, however, permitted these errors to gain entry, perhaps not intentionally. They just were not aware. In other words, they were ignorant of the truth. And when one is ignorant of the truth, they will not be able to discern when there is an error that is being taught. And what makes this error sound so welcome is they use Christian vocabulary. In fact, the uh, Jude uh, uses or addresses to such welcome vocabulary that these false teachers were using. Grace and Jesus. And because they hear them speaking of grace and they hear them speaking of Jesus, they immediately concluded they must be Christian and they must be welcomed in the church. And that explains why they gained entry and they were given free course of circulation and teaching in the church is because of ignorance. It is not that these people hated Jesus. It is not that these people hated the Bible. They were simply ignorant, but that is just the point. When one remains ignorant, especially willfully ignorant, he becomes an ally without realizing it with error. So these people are giving welcome to these false teachers just because they have Christian vocabulary. And that ignorance is today celebrated with words like tolerance. And you know the mantra, doctrine divides, love unites. So let's not be so concerned about doctrine. When you push on doctrine, you will push away people. So let's just love one another and just welcome them. And whatever they want to teach, let them be given the freedom to teach whatever it is they are going to teach. For as long as they can speak of Jesus, 
for as long as they can speak of grace. And that is the same tactic in which good Christian vocabulary becomes the wrapping, but inside is poison. Now it is well known that in the animal world, some of the most venomous animals are the most colorful. And that is precisely their way of attraction to their prey. And when you find certain teachings welcome because there is something attractive to do them, and when you have no discernment in distinguishing truth from error, what is Christian and unchristian, what is biblical and what is unbiblical, or perhaps you do not care at all, then you will become a victim to these false teachers. It challenges us something in order to address ignorance. Never be indifferent and much less hostile to ministry that makes you understand Christian teaching. Wag kang walang pakialam at lalong wag kang galit sa ministeryo na nagpapaunawa ng katuroang Kristiyano. In our immature understanding, we may have been taught some key words that Christians use. And what is fatal is to assume that when you hear those words, they are signs of Christian authenticity. Consider these two words Jude has to confront that were smuggled into the church, but actually were errors. There are those who were, according to Jude, who distort the grace of our God into sensuality. You can pretty much imagine what teaching these people are saying. They were speaking of grace, and grace is free. You are saved by grace alone. And as far as it goes, that it sounds very Christian. But then they draw the implication, because you are saved by grace, you must not be concerned about your life. Whatever happens to your life, however much you live, it doesn't matter that you live like the devil. There is no change in your life that you lived in the world before your supposed conversion. As long as you have gone to the altar and made the decision, perhaps raised your hand and utter the prayer dictated by the evangelist, as long as you can say that you have prayed the sinner's prayer, I accept Christ into my heart, as long as you have that grace, you are safe. You can go to heaven and have no doubt about that. I have heard that thousands of times. And it is a deception. And the reason for Reformed churches established is precisely to combat such error that uses a welcome, celebrated word to us, the word grace, and then they make a distortion of it. And I want to address those of you who probably are in that condition. You believe you are saved by grace. And you celebrate the thought that you're going to heaven when you die. And yet, nothing has happened. Nothing has changed in your life. Jesus has not become your Lord. He does not rule in your decisions, in your thinking. Am I preaching salvation by works? No, a thousand times no. Salvation is by grace alone. What I'm saying is that grace is so powerful that when it invades a heart, it changes that heart. It makes that heart bow down to Christ as Lord, and though remaining imperfect, yet nonetheless changed, transformed, and pursuing holiness. But these people that were welcomed by the churches Jude addressed were so celebrating of these people because they were teaching grace distorted. But not only that, they were teaching Jesus. The problem was, according to Jude, they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, the key there is the word only. They are not denying Jesus himself. No, they are teaching Jesus. And perhaps they may even concede that Jesus is the best there is. But they will not say he's the only one. 
people who love Mary and worship her and make her their savior, they too are saved. Those who go to other religious figures like Buddha or whoever there may be, you cannot be so intolerant of them. And so we celebrate Jesus as one of them and perhaps the best of them, but not the only one. And the moment you hear any denial of the only Savior and Lord, that is not Christian. Our slogan is not primus Christus. Christ is the best. Our slogan is solus Christus. Christ alone. And my friend, if Christ is not alone, your Savior, whatever it is you say of your admiration for Christ, and your love for Christ, and all of those things that you may say of Jesus Christ, if he is not your only Lord and Savior, if you add your works, your church, your morality, any saint, any religious figure, then you are not saved. And now I invite you to come to the only Lord and Savior, which is your only salvation. Jesus Christ, the people in Jude's days were teaching grace. They were teaching Jesus and they were given welcome to the churches. And this is the problem for many today. They are just ignorant. When they see teachers who make them laugh, make them emotional, make them excited, make them thrilled, that's welcome to them. Never mind that they are not teaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So why is Grace Baptist Church occupied with the doctrinal since 1981? Because the war with deception is ongoing. It has not stopped. There has been no ceasefire. And intentionally, it is creeping in the minds of many Christians unawares via media, via the internet, from friends and all sources. And when one comes to church, and if the only excitement that governs him is when the pulpit ministry will be over, his battle is lost. He's not serious about knowing Christian teaching. And when one is not serious in knowing Christian teaching, he becomes ignorant. And ignorance is the ally of deception. When error attracts, let me tell you, it's not the emotional choral number you heard that will prepare you for it. When you are confronted with error, it's that boring doctrinal teaching that you absorb that will prepare you for error. The so-called father of liberal theology was a Polish-born theologian and magnetic preacher, Friedrich Schleiermacher. He was a magnetic preacher. His church was flocked. But his idea of Christianity is just a feeling of dependence upon God without even needing to identify who this God is. Never mind whether the resurrection happened or not. Never mind if Jesus Christ is a true God-man. As long as you have that sense of dependence upon God, it's fine for you. And he became the father of liberalism because of his magnetic, charismatic preaching. Many were influenced by him. He died in 1834. And the year he died, that year, Charles Spurgeon was born. He turned out to be a better preacher. But more than just being a better preacher, he was a defender of the truth. He would have none of liberalism to the point of resigning as the most prominent member of the Baptist Union in his time, he resigned when liberalism 
was given place in the teaching of the association. That's still the call today, brethren. And when deception resembles truth, there sense the grievous peril most dangerously. And that brings us to the second point that faithfulness calls for contention for the unchanging truth. Ang katapatan ay tumatawag sa pakikipaglaban para sa hindi nagbabagong katotohanan. What is the issue that calls for contention? Jude calls it the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now the word once for all describes that which is complete and final. In other words, it is not an evolving truth. It is settled by the apostolic teaching in the church. No one may add to it. No one may change it. It's already once for all delivered. The truth that we hold as a church must go back to the foundation truth of Christ and the apostles. Ang pinangahawakan nating katotohanan bilang iglesia ay bumabalik sa ating saligan sa turo ni Kristo at ng kanyang mga apostol. For the church of today, it means the final mode of that teaching is in what is now written by the apostles in the New Testament. Now, in terms of equipment we use, the church must go along with the progress of technology. Nothing wrong with that. I think it was last week a student of mine asked me, should we be using Bibles on cell phones? Well, I said, you don't want to go back to scrolls, do you? Nothing wrong with the progress of technology. We are not obscurantists to modern means, including the digital. But when it comes to what the truth is, that is settled and final. People love to be known as progressive. But do you know what the Bible says about those who go beyond? Second John verse 9 is about John's treatment of false teachers and this is what he says everyone who goes on ahead this means who goes beyond everyone who goes beyond and does not abide in the teaching of christ does not have god how intolerant of him to say that why doesn't he welcome everyone who is of good spirit teaching anything that is new and resonant to the youth of today. That's going beyond Christ. That's what John is saying. And if any teaching goes beyond Christ and the apostolic teachings of Christ we have in the New Testament, he does not have God. It doesn't matter that he has many things he can boast of in this world. He may have influence. Politicians may flock to his church door to get his endorsement and all these other things churches pursue today. But if they don't have the once for all teaching that goes back to Christ and the apostles, he does not have God. And I don't want a church, and I hope you can repeat that in yourself. We do not want a church that does not have God. Let go of everything, but not God. But the only way we can say we have God is when we are faithful to the teaching. So that truth is once for all delivered. That's exactly the same word in Hebrews 10, verse 10, about the offering of Christ once and for all. Christ, the cross of Christ is not repeated. And so the teaching is not to evolve. It is what it is as delivered by the apostles. The world boasts of their malleable truth, constantly adjusting to the latest fad and words that are welcome to the people of the world, but we go back to Christ as the only Master and Lord, to the apostles for our authority, and this is the teaching that is perpetuated 
in faithful churches. And we need to fight for it. In boxing, there are many what is so-called trilogies. These are matches between two boxers. First fight, boxer number one won. Second fight, boxer number two won. And it will be settled by the third. My favorite trilogy is Pacquiao Morales. In the first fight, because of a headbutt, Pacquiao was all blooded. It was gruesome to watch. But he went on to finish the 12 rounds and lost by unanimous decision. But he went on. In the second fight, he won by stopping Morales, I think in the ninth or 10th round. And then came the third, the decisive match. And it was really decisive. One of the most exciting boxing matches you could ever watch. He stopped Morales, knocked him out on the third round. And the reason we can say that that happened is because blood didn't all. He did not stop during the first fight when he lost. I challenge you, take your role seriously in the church's mandate to contend for the truth. Seriousohin mo ang papel mo sa pakikipaglaban ng iglesia para sa katotohanan. Jude's address to them as beloved, it does not appear in English, but beloved in Greek is plural. It is as a collective body that we fight. We cannot do this individually. And he uses the word contend. There are several words that he could have used to depict the idea of fighting. What is distinct about the word that he chose is the intensity of it. The seriousness. In fact, he uses a word that has now become in our English word, the word agonize. You agonize for the truth. It tells us that defense of the faith will be continuous, agonizing, and costly. It is the cost of being unfashionable in a world that celebrates what's fashionable. The arsenal of error is well-equipped, well-funded, and they have the attraction that the world seeks. So we may ask, of what use is it to contend for the truth against deception? It is a lonely battle. Well, one way to challenge us is adopt the attitude of Jude. You see how he introduced himself, Jude. A servant of Jesus Christ. But wait a minute. Do you know Jude? He's the brother of Jesus in the flesh. He was also the son of Mary by Joseph. In fact, he said so that he was the brother of James. James was the one born after Jesus in the family. And yet, instead of introducing himself, I mean, if he were Filipino, I'm sure he would immediately drop names and say, I'm a brother of Jesus. Instead, he says, I'm writing to you as a servant of Jesus Christ. And when you take serious, seriously your servanthood, contending for the truth is not an option. It's lonely. It's agonizing. You will sometimes be insulted and shouted at. But as a servant of Christ, you are expected to uphold the truth he gave to the apostles, delivered to us. That's why, brethren, we continue to have this doctrinal occupation. Because there is so much of error still in the world. In John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the second part of his book, after Christian has gone to the celestial city, his family, who was left behind in part one, 
followed and <clears throat> they came to the place where in the first part of the book Christian went astray and there they met a man named Mr. Valiant for truth and Mr. Valiant for truth was all blooded and when they asked him where he had been from he said he had been from a battle with three thieves and these three thieves confronted him and gave him a choice. You either join us, return to your original uh, place, or die on the spot because we will kill you. Not much of a choice. But Valiant for Truth did not choose any of those. He did not join, not compromise. He did not return. He did not backslide. And he did not die because he fought. He was blooded in the process, but he fought. That's being valiant for the truth. And my dear friends, my dear brethren, to contend for the truth is agonizing. But because it is Christ we are serving, let us also find it fulfilling. This is the task left unfinished for us. It is the thought that we will be singing in response where the second verse says, Where other lords beside you hold their unhindered sway, where forces that defied you defy you still today, with none to heed their crying for life and love and light, unnumbered souls are dying and pass into the night. Let that grip you with agony that because of error many are dying in their sins and blindness and you and I are the church to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints let us do the task that is still unfinished and let us sing this hymn facing a task unfinished let's close in prayer <clears throat> Our great God and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we do have many examples in the past, in the, from the New Testament to history, of those who have faithfully fought and contended for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And we pray that we may be faithful in our own times. For error has not diminished. Error has become even more attractive. They are in their multitudes. They are well equipped, well funded, well attended. And yet you have called us to be faithful to the teaching that was once for all delivered to the saints. We are surrounded by errors that resemble the truth in sounding the same words that are welcome vocabulary to us, but for them, they become mere wrapping of what is toxic inside. May you give us discernment. We pray for those who are remain in ignorance, in blissful ignorance, without realizing the danger that they expose themselves to because the teaching of the word is available and yet they do not have the diligence to learn of the truth. May our church be faithful to that mandate. It is not the mandate that we would prefer in terms of pleasantness, the restfulness we desire. For it is, as Jude's own word, he uses, suggests, it is agonizing. It is costly. It is the cost of being unfashionable in a world that is intoxicated with what is fashionable. And yet, it is the only way to be faithful or to go beyond what Christ has taught is to be without God. And that is what we can never be without and still remain a church. So we pray that you may make us faithful we pray for those who are hearing us and perhaps they use the name Jesus 
and make it their own assurance without really casting their faith upon him as Lord and Savior and the only one. May you speak to them, expose their errors, and make them come and cast themselves upon Christ. And as a church, we plead with you that you may make us faithful in contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints and make us thankful that we have the faith. And we pray that this may be our treasured possession as a church. And now may the love of the Father, the grace of his Son, the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.